This is probably the most difficult list I've ever had to make. I can't think of a Black Mirror episode that I didn't enjoy watching first time around, but simultaneously I definitely think that some episodes are more memorable than others. Having said that, there are only 19 episodes of Black Mirror, which is also a testament to the show's ability to produce quality over quantity. Although my opinion of particular episodes do slide in from time to time in my analysis series, I thought it would be a good idea to produce a definitive roundup of the worst to best episodes to celebrate my 20th video on Black Mirror. So, without further ado, let's get on with the review. I'm not gonna lie to you guys, Nitpicks makes a fairly good argument about this one. It is so slow. The whole thing could have been cut down by a minimum of 15 minutes, and the setting really does not help this whatsoever. This sort of boring police office thing that takes place whenever people aren't being killed, where we just basically watch social media. One of the biggest problems is the characters. They feel very weak and disconnected from the plot, especially that Asian chap who is just hilarious. But the thing is, is that it does have a good focus on age, but it's so on the nose about it that it feels more like bring your child to work day between the two main characters. The script could do with some reworking as well because it's unclear about some things and far too detailed about others. It kind of prevents any form of visual storytelling. A lot of it is really expository and most of the episode is just dialogue. However, it does effectively criticise like this idea of the online outrage machine and it's nice to think that there may be a valid level of criticism laid before the hands of people who are anonymous or think they're anonymous which is quite interesting and I did quite like the ending I mean it feels very kind of biblical in, in a sense of like the flood I know not everybody dies I just really liked how bleak it was the image of the bodies was really nice it made me really feel quite uncomfortable about the future especially because it's set in a kind of 10 years from now scenario the only problem with this though is that the story ends up becoming way too much like um, the national anthem because it just has another anonymous Heidi man trying to make a statement about how our morality needs a bit of fine-tuning I mean how the hell did the two girls even find him in the end I don't know it's got to be at the bottom I'm afraid when I first watched this I literally just thought politics Again, considering all of the kind of dystopian horror from technology that episodes two, three, four, and five produce, I was really expecting a big boom for the end of series two and I was really disappointed. It's nice that it hones in on the dishonesty of politicians and also in the realms of media. It plays on the kind of dissatisfaction of the audience in both of those fields. But Jim, who we're supposed to be relating to in this story, is terrible, as most of the characters in this story are, but he is particularly bad. If he was optimistic and proud of his work, then slowly turned into a monster as the campaign went on, I think that would just be a much more interesting way of looking at the story. They could have played on this guy's ego, you know, and um, really driven him to the ground, I suppose. It's still kind of like entire history of you, but never mind. I think that would have been a better idea because he just stays a man-child throughout the entire story There's no progression whatsoever apart from the fact that he gets laid and then he's homeless. It's like oh right Okay, well that was that then speaking of that part I think the ending would have made a good episode in itself But I just can't believe that people would willingly go along with Waldo's incitements to violence I know it's like oh yes the dissatisfaction of the people will eventually drive them mad But it's too obvious for me. I don't see that as being particularly realistic Especially as it's trying to go for one of these. Oh, there's no futuristic technology episodes. It doesn't feel reflective It doesn't feel interesting. It's just it's not my favourite episode. I'll give it a bit of credit. I mean, the first half is great. I love the idea, the kind of lo-fi aesthetic of the whole thing. The Men Against Fire reference doesn't make an ounce of sense, but it's still fairly interesting. This idea of the overprotective mother really has a good narrative resonance for me, I don't know. But when Sarah slaps her, that's when it kind of turns into a bit of nonsense. The second half, with the teenager, who 
clearly does not look like one. Like nothing really shocking happens. The ending, you could say, is shocking. <laughs> in that it just doesn't make any sense. Why does she beat her mum up like that? Like, is she aiming to kill her? Like, really? The person that you have seen as your kind of protector, you're just gonna kill her with your with that iPad? I don't know. If she was planning on killing her, I don't know why she didn't just use a knife. But then again, it's sort of like one of those spur of the moment things, I reckon. I'll also give it points for sticking to the theme throughout it of the mother sort of being the, the, the coinciding of addiction and overprotection is something that the episode plays on really well. Especially like how she kind of just has to resist trying to spy on her own kid. I know that's not a very good incentive to be sensitive to the character, but I find it more interesting because I can imagine a lot of parents probably would want to take advantage of that kind of thing. It's interesting most of all because the technology actually did a better job of finding her daughter than she did, you know, trying to phone up all of her friend's parents. I will say that the, the mum character, right, I can't believe she's so tech savvy that she's able to open up her computer, fling all these things onto the screen and just tr and hunt down this guy. No, I still have to fix the DVD player for my mum every time I visit her. I mean, I can't see a mum doing this. It just doesn't seem to kind of, you know, I know it's fiction and all the rest of it, but it just wasn't very believable in that moment. And quite frankly, her performance is a bit questionable. Like when she dances with her middle fingers and yeah, I, <laughs> I, I can't take that seriously. This isn't a bad episode, but I think its biggest problem is that it kind of loses its novelty after the first viewing. It's fairly creepy, but the problem is, is that it takes like 17 minutes of his boring trip around Europe that only has like a couple of plot points that will actually be of any relevance to his gaming experience. And the dialogue, oh my god, it makes Cooper the most unlikable character in the entire series. He's just constantly spouting crap and just makes him really two-dimensional. The best bit, in my opinion, is when Sonya goes into the house and tries to kill him. Oh, it's so fucked. Up, I love it. I knew her putting a dirty knife in the butter would lead to something. It was nice for the showrunners to tackle video games, but it feels like it was written by somebody who barely plays them. I don't know if Charlie Brooke is a big gaming guy. He seemed to put a Bioshock reference in there, and it's not exactly the most unintelligent story ever. I think it's probably just the dialogue and the characters. They just seem very bland and it only gets interesting when he actually goes into the game. If they'd have kind of stretched it out throughout the entire thing like they did with White Bear, that would be more interesting. One more point of credit I will give is the ending. Well, I know it's not really a... I liked the fact that they showed the mum having Alzheimer's, right? That could have been the end of it, but then it's like they add another twist on top of it that he died like as soon as his phone rang. It just turned from excellent to overkill in a matter of seconds. Although it's better than Waldo moment, it still has its same problem. You know, I was saying about how it kind of tackles politics unnecessarily again. This is exactly the same thing in Hang the DJ. Because, like, did we really need another romance episode? Like, I don't have much experience with dating in general, or even Tinder for that matter, so this wasn't really that interesting to me. And the main characters really don't help this problem either because they're really kind of boring. But the thing is as well, right, this is something that is good about it, is that the other characters, I mean, even Security Steve, right, they've got more character than these two have, like combined. The guy can't understand why his ticker is going down, even though like every date that you do it, like you know the rule, you know the rule that you've got to do it together and it's like, oh, I, I, I don't know what's going on, coach, what's happening? But the female, right, she has no flaws whatsoever and can be described in basically the same way as he can. The only thing they share is awkward. The awkwardness creates one of the most uh, cringy moments uh, in the whole show. <laughs> and the thing is as well, it's not like they ever do anything either. Like, I know it's a simulation, but all they do is just skim stones, do exercise, and sit 
on hills until their next date comes along. I just wish that there would be more purpose to those scenes other than dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. We need to talk to Coach now. The best part about the episode though is the twist at the end. It has the quality of many great Black Mirror episodes of being extremely vague and it all kind of tying together right at the end. And it does a really good job of it. It's got a great ending, but like to get there is like, well, it's just like treading through mud, I suppose. I definitely didn't enjoy this one as much as I did when it first came out. It's still got some good bits though. Like I love the opening. I love the hotel scene and I love when she kills the insurance lady. <laughs> so basically whenever any killing happens, I love the overall theme of survival. I love the aesthetic, the kind of, uh, well, the, the location primarily, you know, the Icelandic background. I mean, it's supposed to be set in Scotland, but I mean, I'm not really that convinced by the main woman's um, accent quite frankly. It ultimately feels like a tangled web of good ideas with some good scenery. So why do they have to keep playing? Anyone who know what love is, it's just annoying to hear it in any of the other episodes. But in this one, it's played so many times. But the worst part is, is that it's normally shown in the bits where absolutely nothing is happening. Like the scene where the insurance lady has to go and talk to the bloke who got hit by the pizza truck. That whole scene is so boring. And basically every other scene she's in is really boring. It's only when she dies that it gets interesting. Oh man, this episode has some absolutely top-notch acting. The whole scenario is just excellently thought out and it has some really great dialogue in there as well. The script is just fantastic. Brilliant opening to this show. It has the kind of moral ambiguity that you'll become more and more familiar with as the series goes on. Like, would I really want the Prime Minister to be forced into something like this? It kind of has that brilliant notion of using the technology of today to point the mirror back at us. So when we see all of the, the, like the music playing and the princess is dropped on that bridge and there's absolutely nobody to help her because everyone's watching the TV. It's just absolutely brilliant social commentary. I don't think we needed to see the guy who orchestrated it all though. I guess the only reason it was there is that he didn't really cut off the woman's finger after all. It has a few other kind of segments that also kind of don't fit really very well with the the overarching kind of story. It's like the, they try and put in the woman from the media. She obviously takes those pictures of herself and sends it to that, what I presume is politician or someone who works in parliament, but obviously he, he doesn't get seen again. And then she just goes out and tries to film where they think the princess is and then she just gets shot and like, that's it. So I was kind of disappointed by her lack of depth primarily. So after I watched this again, I realized I might have been a little tough on this one in my analysis. I still hold the opinion that it feels a little bit uninspired and the script could have injected some character development in there or just been entirely silent. But oh my god, it's a hell of a watch. The cinematography and technical aspects of this episode are amazing, especially the, the dog. It is just one of the meanest depictions of artificial intelligence ever. And it does it so concisely in the short time frame that it has to work with, but it also didn't undermine how effective humans are at killing too. I think that's probably where the tension comes from. I'm also more positive about the ending as well now. I've definitely changed my mind because it's obviously not a direct reference to White Bear as it's unclear what colour they would be given that the episode is in grayscale. And it's a nice kind of point to say that, you know, human joy is basically non-existent now with the takeover of the machines. This is another artificial intelligence warrior, but it feels a lot more foreseeable. So the, the idea of connecting kind of social media activity with intelligence is just brilliant. I mean, there are some people I know that, you know, they put their whole bloody lives on Facebook. You know, there is such a, a wealth of information that could be scooped up at any time. You know, I can actually envisage this happening, especially on the kind of auditory and text level. Perhaps not so much on the real life um, 
version of Ash, but at the same time he's interesting too, because like a child he kind of learns how to adapt and it's really quite creepy, um, but at the same time it's sort of, you feel pity for him. The kind of emotional manipulation is really good in that one. The idea of putting the dead in the attic is a really haunting aspect of the episode and um, grief is explored tremendously in this episode and it looks great too. My only critique is those hysterical outbursts from Hayley Atwell. They ruin her performance. And it's kind of the same in Archangel, um, but at least it's more limited in this episode. I'm also not a big fan of the score in this episode. Uh, not the soundtrack. The use of the BG song is absolutely stellar, but the score is overplayed and uninteresting, so that's probably why I haven't put it higher on the list.